Hello and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. I'm Stephanie Valdez, co-owner of the bookstore. Community Bookstore will be celebrating 50 years in business this fall, and we credit the support of readers and writers for this milestone. Thank you so much for spending an evening with us. Tonight, we're joined by Eugene Lim on the occasion of his latest novel, Search History, which is just out from Coffeehouse Press. Um, he'll be in conversation with Jonathan Latham. Now for some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they, they cannot see or hear you. If you would like an audio transcription, you can turn that on at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to submit them. We'll ask some of those at the end of the program if there's time. There's also a chat button at the bottom through which I'll be posting a link to purchase tonight's book if you haven't already. And finally, you can find the rest of our fall programming on our website. For instance, on October 21st, Benjamin Labatut joins us to present his new novel, When We Cease to Understand the World. Let me tell you a bit about tonight's guests and then we'll get started. Eugene Lim is the author of the novels Fog and Car, The Strangers, and Dear Cyborgs. His writings have appeared in The Brooklyn Rail, The Baffler, Dazed, Fence, Little Star, Granta, and elsewhere. He is a high school librarian, runs Ellipsis Press, and lives in Queens, New York with Joanna and Felix. Jonathan Latham's latest novel is The Arrest. He is the best-selling author of 12 novels, including The Feral Detective, The Fortress of Solitude, and Motherless Brooklyn, winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award. A recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship, Lethem has been published in The New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, Rolling Stone, Esquire, and The New York Times, among others. He currently teaches creative writing at Pomona College in California. And I'll turn it over to you two. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, Eugene. Hi, Jonathan. It's great to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you. So I'm officially in the host and um, interlocutor roles. So I'm going to try to be hostly. So the first thing I'll say is um, I'll, I'll give a guide to how we'll spend some time. I'm going to ask you to read. I know you've got something that you, you might be willing to read to us uh, for a little bit. And then you and I can converse for a while. And um, in the meanwhile, uh, questions can be stacking up. I hope they will be in the Q&A uh, tab, which is there on the Zoom. Um, thing on the bottom and um and i'll start to look at them at a certain point and and do my best to share as many of those questions um with with you eugene so you can answer them for everybody um as as we have time for and so um that's what i'm thinking uh and i'm really excited to talk to you and see you but first i want to hear you read a few pages of the, of um search history the new the new book sure um Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, thanks to Noah and Stephanie and Community Bookstore for hosting. Uh, it's a great treat and honor to split screens with you, Jonathan. Um, but to start us off, I'll read a, a little bit from the new novel. Um, it is, uh, it's in the middle of the book, but I don't think there's much that has to be set up. But um, here we go. This is from a chapter called Intelligent Artifice. Muriel says, do you feel changed by Frank's death? Someone says, the idea of a novel isn't very rigid. It's all over the place. And at most you might say it's a work of the imagination labeled by the author as fiction, constructed with language and greater than a certain length. Muriel says, because for me, it has been a subtle but decisive shift occurring over months or like with the death of my mother, a continuing change that took place over years and in fact is ongoing. Someone says, or you could say of the novel what someone gave for the definition of poetry, that is, all that is claimed as poetry at any given time. Muriel says, and when something profound happens in your life, like a fatal diagnosis or a car crash or the death of a loved one, or even something heard that fundamentally changes one's approach, you know, the kind of event embodied in the phrase, it changed my life. I say to someone, do you want to know the kind of intelligence that makes art? Muriel says transformation, metempsychosis, reincarnation. I say to someone else who is nodding yes, I went over to my friend's studio the other day. Muriel says, what I'm saying is life is a bitch and then you die. I say, my friend is older now in her 80s about. 
I say, my older friend lives rather beautifully and simply. I say, like a nun. I say, I love visiting my older friend's studio, which doubles as her apartment. Everything there is as neat and orderly as a monastery or a submarine. I say, I sometimes think of my older friend in that small apartment, which doubles as her art studio and where she has lived for decades, nearly half a century. And I picture her sleeping, drawing, reading, cleaning, painting, a true believer, an arhat, a renunciate. It's a light-filled chamber. All the walls and shelves of my friend's art studio, which doubles as her apartment, are whitewashed. And the sills and tables hold an assortment of thriving and elegant plants. I had come over under the excuse of perhaps buying a piece of artwork for my husband's birthday. It wasn't really a false reason, that's why I was there, but mostly I wanted to visit her, and this seemed the easiest justification. She doesn't often take visitors. My older friend, let's say her name is Helen, is an exquisite artist, self-taught, and she should have received much greater recognition in her lifetime than she has, but I admit that part of me is glad she isn't, quote, successful, a selfish part of me. A selfish part of me thinks if she'd achieved the success she deserves, then there would be no way I could find myself encased in the warm sunlight of her studio, which doubles as her apartment. There'd be no way I'd be flipping through her wondrous artworks with Helen looking over my shoulder. No way she'd be even interested in hearing my opinions about her work. It's an intimate in encounter. And the selfish part of me realizes Helen and I probably wouldn't even be friends if she'd had, like many of the members of her social circle, gotten signed up by the most blue chip, toniest galleries in town. Her traveling companions of the time, if I named them, you'd recognize as some of the more renowned, and so also now, some of the wealthier artists alive. Even more selfishly on my part, I'm glad because this misfortune of Helen's not being rewarded in a worldly way for her stunning artwork, art which I submit to you is as good and at times superior to many of her more famous peers, has tempered her worldly ambition so that, to be honest, she's more pleasant to be with has humbled and focused her and in an odd way purified her. I mean that Helen is not bitter, not so much and not really anymore. I mean, she was. Helen is an extremely ambitious and adventurous artist. How could she not be bitter? Knowing what she's accomplished and seeing others with less talent or rigor being given the world, it could have, and for a while it did, eat her up inside. Her friend, Frederick Moreno is a good example. Freddie painted these neat little geometric paintings that no one today cares two shits about. And they are little doodads, really. Nothing bad, but nothing special. But for a few years, he was a darling because he could, and he would admit this, make rich people smart, feel smart for collecting them. This is the trick, he'd say to Helen, under the guise of giving advice, but really as a way to brag. Make sure the rich can understand your work, but just barely. Helen liked Freddie for his cynicism as much as she envied his success. When they were in their middle age, Freddie was buying homes upstate and on the coasts. He was vacationing in Asian and European capitals and wearing designer shirts that hid or somehow made noble his ever expanding paunch, while Helen remained poor, hungry, alert. In her third story apartment, slurping soup and making the daily grind eke out a living, of course Helen was bitter. And Freddie was on one hand easier to envy and dismiss because he was basically a talented con artist. But there were others, and Helen wouldn't even name them for me because it was still too painful, who were as good as her, or maybe even a little less so, but respectable. And they had cushy teaching gigs and retrospectives while she paced her apartment, dined nightly on penny and ch canned chickpeas, and took naps for recreation. Of course she was bitter. But then she wasn't, or not as much. Something snapped in her mid-60s. Perhaps, like you're saying, Muriel, maybe Helen died. It was something like that. She died and was reborn, destroyed and reformed. The same Helen, but different. Her life was changed. And she let most of her anger and bitterness go. Not all of it. Her ears still perk up at opportunity. She's still ambitious even now, but she's also realistic. The game is almost over for her. She's not going to win like she wanted to. Now she's pure like those who are pure because they never had a chance to be impure. I'm now almost an outsider artist, she jokes, almost. And her work, which is always good in the past decade has become great. She makes it only for herself and whatever gods she believes in, you can tell. It's been stripped entirely of bullshit. I flipped through a recent series of drawings. The sun is soft in her white, neat apartment where she has padded around for half a century. 
These are amazing, I tell her. Thank you, Helen says. And when the afternoon with Helen is over, I leave an idealist. I've entered a cynic, someone for whom art was worldly exercise or perhaps a collection of experiences to own or to show off. But I leave thinking art making must be something else, an individual struggle perhaps with form or the mindful juggling of an ever unfolding pair of question and answer. What is poetry, someone asked. And someone answered, all that is claimed to be poetry at any given time. That's wonderful. Um, I, I love this book, uh, Eugene. It's the, the third of yours I've, I've read. I'm saving one. I always like to have one uh, so that I haven't read everything. But um, <clears throat> you are um, exemplifying with search history, this um, uh, characteristic of your own work that uh, it is such an open structure, such a uh, permitting kind of novel that you've um, invented for yourself to write, but always with a formal tension that comes from what this passage you read makes really explicit, which is a demand that the book be thinking about what um, a novel can be or or what a novel is um, while it does its work. And so the 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 way it becomes inclusive or or um, open structured is um, is a function of this this search, you know, uh, and there, so there's your, there's the word in your title which fun functions in so many multiple ways. and I, I, I think um, one of the things I wanted to for sure is ask you to talk about, uh, the idea of search and 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 the search history, but also um, uh, I love the definitions of the novel that are being worked on in this passage. And um, it makes me remember another one that I've heard, which I think the poet Randall Jarrell said that uh, a novel was defined as a prose narrative of a certain length with something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in other words, if you perfect a text, it might be a short story or, no, or a novella, but once it's long enough to have something that can't be fixed about it or um, it has a, a kind of a disjunction or a breakdown or a willed um, passage, something that is forced, then, then you have a novel. I think you need something, something broken or something open about it, it's true. And I think that um, I've heard other writers say this, that when they're composed, when they're writing a novel, when they're going through that struggle, they always hit this moment of crisis. You know, they've painted themselves into a corner, or um, or it's not coming together, or whatever problem is overwhelming them, and it kind of hits this peak crisis moment. And usually, I mean, in, in my a few experiences, that's what makes the novel. How you respond to that moment of crisis um, seems to be the, seems to be the case. Um, the the you asked about the title and I think it was a um, it, it serves multiple functions but the the main one for me was it was a novel um, kind of around this sense of loss and a sense of grief and mourning for a friend and uh, but I, you know I didn't want to make a confessional novel or, or or speak about it head on or I didn't feel capable about it of uh, doing that so in some ways this was all the all the um, transformations of that grief, but also all the, all the, you know, facing, facing kind of the, uh, the inability to comprehend or, of loss or the, the really, the, the, the limit of creating narratives to make sense of that kind of thing. So I think that for me fundamentally is why it's called search history, um, but also because of this open structure, which I think, um, mimics or also I felt, uh, was a thing that uh, was mir was interesting mirror to this this narrative that we all go through, which is not the traditional novel, but is how we interact and how we uh, wrestle with and explore the internet. Um, uh, all those kind of um, non-growing, but kind of uh, just moving from thing to thing, but it doesn't build in the way a traditional novel does. But um, it's compelling for us uh, how we move through it. Uh, it's it's absorbing how we move through it, um, and how does that actually work? One of the words that occurred to me to describe that 
characteristic of this book structure was the idea of <clears throat> displacements, that there's um, a displacement of grief into other vehicles, the dis displacement of uh, Frank Exit's person, person possibly into the dog, and the displacement of our attention, I mean, also the reincarnations that, that are begin the cycle at the beginning of the book are a kinds of a kind of displacement and it 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 that word embeds for me both of the uh elements that you um that you evoke one is the di diversion a, a glance sideways mm -hmm. um, but also an overspilling something that's mm -hmm. displacing is also too much you know and it so it it um it makes stuff spill over yeah i think of it I, I can see that, that too. I think of the words um, uh, transference and projection, yeah. like Freudian terms almost. But the the and the the one Freudian joke I put in the book is Freud had uh, Freud had um, he had dogs, and so the and so the I think the one dog that is named is named after Freud's dogs. And the joy the joke with Freud's dogs is Freud's daughters thought that he, the daughter thought he loved the dog more than. He loved uh, the kid and said something about him transferring. Anyways, the um, I think that there are these displacements or these shifts or these swerves, but um, the, the the way the one the the thing that I think helps or the thing that I think coheres them as opposed to just being leaps to um, to really uh, uh, dis disjunctive non related things is that. They all kind of point in the same kind of search, or the same, you know, and similar to when you go through your internet history or search history, um, you, you realize that you're jumping from thing to thing to thing, but they're it, displaced maybe from thing to thing to thing. But there's also this concurrent um, thread or theme that at least you have in your mind that puts all, all these things together. Um, and so that kind of constellates all these different kind of displacements um, and aligns them almost like a magnet, like Yeah, well, and I think that this aspect of the book, the alignment is <clears throat> um, an incantatory effect. Mm -hmm. And that uh, I, this, one of the th things the book incorporates very beautifully is um, a, a, a strong and, and confident uh, appropriation of Joe Brainerd's I remember in the middle of the book. And, and so it seems like this served partly as a way for the incantation that was lurking inside the series of, of projections or displacements to come into the light and, and, and name itself because of that commemorative incantation of I remember this and I remember that. Yeah, I mean, I love Joe Brainerd. I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's a pretty common creative writing exercise to try one of these. Yeah. Um, what I like, I think there are two things I would say about the autobiographical interludes is that often this is often there is like a secret engine of grief in a novel or a secret emotional source. And uh, one thing I thought and one thing I thought because there was it was kind of uh, a wild story on top um, and uh, it, it was hard for a lot of things, maybe uh, maybe for a reader to understand why things were happening, I would just show the secret engine. And, you know, of a dying friend or of an mm -hmm. aging mother or aging yeah. friend. So that kind of helps the reader, oh, okay, now I understand, maybe I can uh, make sense of the allegory or make sense of the, these themes. Um, the other thing about the Brainerd part is it's, I thought the, I thought I would improve upon it. I would, <laughs> I would mess with it by saying, uh, I remember my mother. Someone else remembering. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Well, you know, it's funny um, to talk about Brainerd for just a, a moment. I once taught that book and I didn't know what I wanted to say about it other than to have the students experience it. So I was learning when it came time to talk with them about what they found in it, uh, what, what I could say about it besides that it existed. And <clears throat> we concluded working together on it that you know, it's 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 uh, this struck me because you spoke of um, the Brainerd in terms of exposing a secret within your own book. But I think that the the trick to I remember is that it it's a bit dodgy. And actually, it's it's a 
um, presentation of, um, I'll show you this in order not to show you this other thing. That by, by making a, a very public ritual of confession or display, he's also reserving other things behind the scrim. And that the, the, the strong impression of his secrecy or of his uh, cultivating um, privacy behind the remembrances is, 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 was sort of the secret of that book. Yeah, I think of it a couple of ways. I think of it as, I mean, all narratives are hiding things, right? So it's a list poem where he chooses the things in the list poem. Uh, and he doesn't choose them in a traditional way where um, if you're telling a story, a memoir of yourself, well, I was born, I grew up, I had these bullies and I had you know, these teachers, or whatever. He doesn't do any of that. He just, um, he just hits points of memory. And that builds both a character it, and it builds kind of a story in this in, in a totally pointillistic way. Um, and like you're saying, he gets to choose the different points. He gets, he gets to kind of shape shape himself as well. Um, but on but on the other hand, there's a there's at least the, sh the sheen or the, the, the facade of honesty. Like he at least is picking these things. These things are presumably true. Um, uh, and uh, but you're also correct in saying that there are all these other things that he has not chosen. Yeah, great. So let's talk maybe a little bit about the presence of um, artificial intelligence as an emblem uh, and a kind of a, a character too in, in your book because it, it announces itself uh, at one point, and then the um, uh, anxiety uh, about artificial intelligences um, lurks along, and and different characters have to sort of audition their their um, their relationship to it. Yeah, I am not. You know, I, I I'm not a. Fair enough. I, I can't presume or claim tremendous knowledge. And I've been, but I've been reading about it, and I've been trying to. I'll try to sum up this thought, which is, I guess, my main thought about it in the book is that we're going through this huge transformation. I mean, uh, the Steve Erickson, Steve, Steve Erickson has that, uh, that uh, book title, Rubicon Beach. Yeah. I mean, we are, we're in the middle of crossing. We're wading through this river. We, the, the moment transformation is happening. But the, the, the epigraph at the beginning of the book uh, by um, Fran Leibowitz that says, the book is the closest thing to a human being, right? Um, some of these, the, the major, that's my cat in the background, I don't know if you can hear, but the, uh, um, this latest GPT-3 or these latest uh, language processing AIs, they've been fed the internet, really. They've, been, they've, been, they've scraped the internet, given it to them, and it's, 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 uh, they joke like the, uh, the, um, uh, the future AI is going to, be fed exactly us, be fed the words that we're saying right now. Um, why is a book the closest thing to a human being? Because you can, because you hold another person in your hands, you hold, a writer will often say, I felt naked on the page. Like you do, th though there are, um, there's artifice like Brainerd's of choice and hiding, you do feel like you get to know a person or you, there is a, there is a sentience in there. These machines, have eaten up all of our words. Um, so in the, I wrote a story and I was very proud of this line, but I will, I will uh, give it to you. And the, the line was uh, a, 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 a proposed Turing test variation where the cyborg asks itself questions to determine if it's human. And I think that's what we're doing on social media, but it's also like, here are these things, here are these books that represent um, a, a life or human mind. And then here are these machines that have been given like all of human speech uh, and which, which really is the combination of uh, technology and biology, which is the most human, right? So that I think is the, is the question that keeps, um, that, we're, that we're having now and that we will be facing maybe more directly soon. That's great. I mean, first, I just wanna, of course, agree with you so totally that, I mean, I always feel that if my books w work at all, it's because I've loaned them everything that I am. That I, and so I'm therefore I'm transparent in them. I'm I have no really meaningful claim to be uh, private or or um, invisible. Uh, if anyone cares to glance, they could really see me. And um, 
but also I'm thinking about, of course, the book as opposed to the AI, and it's 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 so much more human, partly because it's also um, uh, of its limitations, its physical embodiment. It can fall apart, yeah. and and it and as a container, it's not infinite. Uh, it's stuck. Yeah. It's yeah. entrenched in in time and space. No, there are differences, and that's why we like. I presume we like bookstores and libraries as opposed to the uh, the entirety of information that is possible in some database or on Amazon or whatever, because these selections are either through accidental or human creation um, finite, but um, but are but are sorted and arrayed in ways that show an intelligence also. So um, so yeah, there there are differences. So um, I'm. Uh, just as a sneak preview and also a, a, a solicitation, I've, I've begun to see some terrific questions come into the Q&A, and I'm going to definitely, all, all of the ones that I see now, I'm going to make sure to have time to to say to you aloud, but others can come in. So I'm, I'm reminding the audience to give, give me questions, but also the, the good questions that are in there remind me to ask you some really simple ones about um, how you arrived at uh, basic decisions about uh, making this book, which you know, I, I just mentioned the physicality of a book as an object, and this book has um, pictures in it. It has really interesting, surprising uh, screenshots and images in it. And also, there are choices in the bookmaking that I that I really love. Like the title page is more than than the title and who you are. It's a kind of a broadside um, in in the in the sense of uh, how much it offers, but also the way it's typeset. And when did these ideas, at what stage did these ideas about the physical presentation of this book lodge in the project? Uh, how did they, or how do they emerge? I think that the title page is something that I have also in my, uh, in two books ago, um, but it is, it's kind of the title page and then the first illustration, which is by a wonderful artist named Wendy Shu, who's a um, who's a cartoonist, uh, but um, both of those, I think, and the photographs, but both of those specifically talk about uh, the technology of the book and uh, the 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 front is page. Yeah, that's a that's by Wendy Shu, who has a um, who has a graphic novel called Mooncakes. It's a middle school middle school uh, uh, aimed graphic novel, but she's terrific. Um, but the 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 long kind of Donald uh, Daniel Defoe kind of 18th century novel, um, or or Melville has a great kind of uh, prologue as well. Those are just kind of uh, pointers to the tradition of the book, you know. And and uh, here we are at something that is trying a novel that is perhaps trying to do. Um, Trying to think about how narratives work in a in an internet age or in a, in, a, in our current paradigm, but it but I think it's it's kind of ironic that uh, that we are so text based um, and these search histories our internet searches are so linear um, and they the novel might in some ways be able to uh, show a mirror to our experience with the internet, which is which is strange. But the, but the frontispiece or I mean the title page. I think is pointing to kind of the, the, those um, excitement of uh, an adventure novel, maybe from the past. Um, and then the her cartoon or that image. Whenever I was a kid and I was reading like um, uh, Hardy Boys or something like that, there would be those images of the adventure story, and they would never, it seemed to me often, never link up to the text. And I always liked that disjunction of Oh, I have to flip back, and now that that scene refers to this text, and it wasn't how I was thinking about it. But I can, you know, usually they they bothered me, but they were there, and they showed this other interpretation. I love this, and it's something that I've always thought about: is that the the um, the the slippage between illustrations that con slightly contradict the physical action described in a text sometimes even when an author illustrates their own uh and i started to think of this as a, a a value a kind of added value that the the stories were trying to tell one story and sometimes the drawings were 
trying to insist on another right. point of view. So uh, that's why often these these images that intrude on the text are are weird interpolations or weird contradictions. Even. The same, and then the the obvious uh, uh, precedent is, or one of them is Sable. And Sabo, as we found out in this recent biography, which I had read, but I, I had uh, heard, uh, I had seen a video of him speak. He manipulates all his photographs, so he, you know, they're they're not um, they're not true. Um, and in Austerlitz, he has this whole thing about. I think it's a picture of Wittgenstein's eyes, and it speaks about how these philosophers. Or he's he's in a he's in a. Um, uh, a zoo of nocturnal animals and speaks of their wide eyes and compares them to these philosophers who must have great big eyes look, looking out into um, uh, into reality and come. And I always thought that that was a weird, uh, it struck me as a weird racialized thing. And I thought I will throw in uh, Pat Morita's eyes and we'll have a visual joke about um, about the wide-eyed philosophers. Anyway, and so these texts, these images intrude the text and they're also, um, they contradict the text sometimes, but they're also um, uh, uh, places where more fiction can be created. You know, they're, they're not true. Yeah. So while we're talking about images, let me move that to something slightly more um, uh, <clears throat> figurative. I remember you and I, felt a lot of excitement talking when when you visited my students here at Pomona College about the idea that um, a novel is written toward some kind of uh, image, uh, a, a, possibly a set piece it, it, or a or like a, a tableau, an image in motion, or possibly even something more static, like a almost like a sculptural um, event. And I wondered if you would talk about your interest in that as a way to think about writing a novel and uh, how it might describe um, something in search history. When you when we talked about that, when you told me about that, I thought that that was an intriguing idea and one that I don't think I employed exactly, but I liked it because um, I think what I don't like about novel writing, especially traditional novel writing, is that there's a lot of work involved in getting characters from here to there, or you know, to move the plot forward. I mean, there, there's obviously people who are masterful in it, but I never liked doing it. I never liked putting in the work to get from, okay, this has to happen to that. Um, whereas the idea of having an image that you're working towards, it just was a better kind of magnet or better kind of gravity and you didn't have to think about everything eventually i'm going to end up over there um, and that kind of pull i think i um, had some sympathy or empathy with i don't think i do that exactly but i set up i set up different frames or i set up different um uh like with it like with a genre trope like it's a car chase i think i've had a few different chase scenes and it struck me one day where like, okay, we'll have the chase scene. It'll be exciting for the reader. Uh, it'll be, um, or it'll be, or it'll be a goof or a joke for the reader. One of those, one or all those things. Um, but then in the middle of this kind of kinetic, hectic happening, two characters could come and have a very, and have a conversation where the pacing is totally different, where we go into this philosophical thought or we go into this, uh, a dialogue where, where people are more relaxed. And that dialogue, which is more relaxed is much, is in, you know, is the place where, you know, maybe I was interested in, in, and more importantly, it gives you a lot of freedom. It gives you room to improvise. And that's the most, that's the more fun thing I realized um, when you come to the writing desk, the, 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 you know, the things that you don't plan. So, so the idea of the image for me was, or working towards an image or even having these frames, they're just setting up cells or setting up moments where you can, uh, you can have fun. Or you can, you know, you can do the stuff that makes writing joyful or interesting, um, and that's why I liked. Um, that's why I liked those two methods. That's great. Yeah, one of the interesting things in search history is that it. Uh, you, uh, speaking of a kind of projection or or um, or transference, your characters sometimes seem to be interested in and capable of deciding what kind of scene they want to be 
uh, experiencing. So they might be in the chase scene and then say, I would really like to be in a cafe having a, a, a conversation at bre a, over breakfast. Um, can we switch to that now? You know, so it, it, it was as if that, um, that uh, capricious freedom was something you'd uh, loaned out from, from your own writing experience to the characters themselves. That's funny. I don't know. I think that, I think that, um, you know, in, in, in like TV land or in, uh, there's always the AB role. You know, there's the idea of structuring stories where we go, okay, we go with this group and then this other group is having this, you know, this side adventure and we flip back and forth. Um, um, I think for whatever reason, I think that that's, uh, that provides some balance, some weird natural balance in terms of how many plot lines a, a, a reader or an audience member can hold. Um, you could expand that obviously, but, but I, like, I like that balance and that shifting from, um, from, from a place of speed to a place of quiet and then, uh, but giving, giving the reader enough that they're, um, that they're pleased to go through the changes. It, sometimes when you read things where they, there's a switch, when you get to the next chapter, you're like exhausted. You're, okay, now I got to set up for this this other thing. And I'm hoping, I was hoping that there's a, more of a flow from one thing to another, which might be what you're speaking about, where a character, where you can feel like a character wants to go to this other place and then are, is allowed to do so. Yeah, right. Okay, I'm gonna um, uh, make use of these great questions. So, um, and and I'm gonna uh, not take them in exact the order that they're in because I have some 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 thoughts about what might work best but I'm gonna pretty much uh, just read them aloud when I go to them so this is a question I really love and um, it's so simple uh, Shannon uh, asked does does actually being a writer seem different than the way you imagined it might be when you first started <laughs> um, maybe <laughs> I mean <laughs> If um, life is so different in middle age than it was when you were 20, um, that's just terribly true. <laughs> um, I think if I was 20 and I looked at myself now, I would think, you know, th this is, this is um, frankly more success than I would have, could have hoped for, you know, in, on some level. Uh, uh, simultaneously, it can be incredibly disappointing. <laughs> uh, but it's also, I think, I don't know what the I don't know what the main differences are. But one of the differences is you are familiar with what you're doing. So before, when you're young, you might be you might pro you project you imagine the the, the the strength of vitality that comes from. <laughs> being a writer in a full writing career or the excitement or the, the, the great parties you get to go to or something like that. Um, none of that is true. If you feel like you feel like everything is like this aching crawl towards the finish line every time. And if you have to go to a public event, it's all like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm here. You know, it's like, it's a combination of, but some, you know, of course some things are, are wonderful. Uh, so it's not all complaints, but I don't think it's what I expected um, there, but, but the, but on the other hand, I will say coming to the writing desk or the notebook uh, regularly is much more of a fulfilling habit. Maybe more, not more than I knew, but, but it's a way to go through life and to process that which you are living that, is, um, that makes you feel um, complete or that makes you feel like uh, that you can it gives you a tool to process what you're going through. Often you read a book in like a long time after and you go, oh, that's what I was thinking back then. Or that's how I that's how I, I was depressed back then. Or I was, you know, I was that kind of person back then. And you know, just like we, you know, you're naked on the page or a book is the closest thing to a human being, you can recognize yourself in that capsule moment um, better than you did in that moment. Great. So this may in some ways extend some of the thinking that you were just doing. And it's two different questions that are kind of the same. Two people seized on um, your really evocative thought about uh, the, the moment of crisis that arises for every novel writer. And uh, 
Lisa Chen asked very simply, what was your moment of crisis in writing this book? And then um, uh, uh, Jacob Goldstein uh, extends this thinking about how, um, uh, you know, quotes you back to yourself that there's always a moment of crisis and just asks, um, and, and that the way you respond to the crisis is the crucial uh, aspect of the book in question. So. Uh, both are I really asking you to talk more about this and the way that the crisis plays out for you in this case. I think there was a there's an emotional crisis and then there was a formal crisis in the book. There are probably more crises, but I can't remember them all. But the 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 fundamental one was uh, how do you how to approach grief without being uh, with honestly, you know, how to approach grief in a way that is. Um, I don't know if realistic is the right word. I don't even know if uh, representative or articulating it is the right word, but um, it is, it's a common human emotion, uh, but you're trying to make something singular, uh, presumably. Uh, and it is also a common human emotion which, which people feel very singularly about their own grief, right? They, they own it and they feel, um, I don't know if they own it, but they feel like it's theirs. It's, you know, and they feel like because you had a relationship with the person that no one else has, you feel like well, you don't understand what my grief is like, or, or you, your grief is your grief and my grief is my grief. There's something about that that um, uh, that is that would be difficult to make into fiction without aggrandizing oneself or or, or sentimentalizing it or romanticizing. It. So that was the first crisis, I think. Um, and then the, and then I think that uh, kind of formally the big crisis in the book was, it, I think it's the same crisis in a lot of, in, in maybe all the books, but the last two is, is it a novel? When does it become a novel? When does this, uh, when does this collection of bits cohere? Will it cohere? Will people think it coheres? Um, and that's taken, um, a bit of faith and a bit of um, um, a bit of a bit of faith and trust that you have that I have um, worked something enough and, and put it together enough that it feels like a substantial thing that you could call a novel, uh, just like the the reading that I read. That it is something that proclaims itself a novel because it is a novel. Uh, I think those are the two first crises that come to the top of my head. Great. So um, Lewis asks about the literal uh, um, in indicator of a search history and wants to know the simplest thing, which is what role did Googling or searching play in your compositional process? I mean, uh, I think it's really, it's a great question for almost any writer, but here it's like got a recursive <laughs> um, uh, uh, quality. I liked um, I liked Delillo's like idea on research when he wrote that um, cryogenic book, the, the and zero K, zero K. Yeah. And he he's in interviews they go did you, did you did you do a lot of research and he no I just he he just kind of he wanted to know as much about the science as he knew he wanted to use it as a metaphor he didn't want to know details and I and I tried to do that with AI but you know in the end AI was too was had more details than I needed um, to know. Um, but I will say one thing about the epigraphs, which I think are interestingly, um, it has this interesting aspect to it, which is somewhat uh, to lose this question. Um, maybe, maybe not, but maybe interestingly so, is that in the past, you would have epigraphs that would point to books and you would have to know those books or read those books um, or search out those books. And they would have to be somewhat by famous people, therefore, or you know, in some kind of context that was well known. Now you can Google a phrase, or you can do a search of a phrase, um, and that brings up the context to it. And that gives the writer a little bit more freedom, I think, to choose their epigraphs from the collection of texts that is out there, as opposed to like um, canonical ones. Right. And so that's that's interesting to me. So that you that's an additional addition uh, intrusion of reality into the text, kind of based on, on, on searching. Um, the strangest thing I find myself Googling, though, um, 
I, uh, I kept, I don't know if this is the answer, but, but I published a woman with ellipsis press named Karen Anwili, who I love, and she had a, a phrase, and it's kind of a, it's kind of an homage to her, the dysthymic something. And I made the, the artificial intelligence scientist, not a depressive, not a, but the dysthymic. And I would Google constantly, how do you pronounce that word? <laughs> it's a dysthymic or something. And uh, I, it, I still don't really know, but I think it's one of those words where you can have multiple pronunciations. I know, that was something I Googled recently. Great, great. Yeah, I'm always interested in vocabularies and how you can end up writing a word fairly comfortably that you've never used in any spoken context and then um, all the time yeah and and then sometimes you try to read it aloud and you realize you I mean you literally don't know its pronunciation but you also don't even beyond that even if you happen to land on the correct pronunciation it's not somatically your word it's it it's a it's a page word for you I, it's I not in your body I heard a writer and I won't name them but they um I read their novel I love their novel it had a lot of Spanish in it. and then I saw them read and I realized oh they have no real fluid, fluency in Spanish at all. And, uh, and it was funny because I was reading it as something that was in, in, you know, totally at ease and natural and fluent. And I think that's the, that's the uh, illusion that the writer has for all kinds of things, uh, you know, that, they, that they, the illusion of their knowledge is, is everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But also there are things you only know for as long as it takes to place them in your book and then you immediately become a... Um, uh, you know, you 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 have an amnesia because you you've researched just to the point of, uh, of of usage, and then and then it's gone from you, and you're not you're not an expert anymore. Um, great. Uh, so okay, um, here's a question that is great specific. Uh, what is the source of that quote about poetry that it is uh, all that is claimed as poetry in a particular time? That is. Um... Uh, my friend Corey Frost gave me that, and it, but it is from a introduction to, I think a performance art, uh, it's from Poetry and Cultural Studies, a reader edited by Maria Damon and Ira Livingston. Great. <laughs> um, okay, I'm, I'm now uh, scanning here. Oh yeah, so do you draw or sketch the tableau in your book? Do you have a visual art outlet of any kind, or do you satisfy this only with these vicarious appropriations? And also, uh, do you make visual images when you read other writers? Do I, do I make visual do you, images in do my you mind? Do, do you do visualization um, um, comparable to this kind of, uh, I think this is a, a reference to our conversation about having an image in mind as you write, and the question is whether that's uh, analogous to something that's going on in your brain when you're reading. Um, generally speaking, I don't think so. Though sometimes, yes. Uh, but um, Eugene Martin once said to me, or maybe it was in there, but, but I was talking to a writer who described their process as, cr as creating an image out of language. Like they don't have, they, they just want to build it through language alone uh, and the image will come through the language, but there's no preconceived uh, landscape or scene or art. And that, um, and that's also, I think, uh, valuable because because then you are very foregrounded in language. Um, but I can't draw really at all. And I do have, uh, uh, I do think of photography and I, and I definitely think of collage and how these different visual elements came, come together in the book. But, um, but it's not usually part of my process. Great. So this is a question that I'm interested in because it's um, kind of not a question that I would uh, uh, know how to ask or I wouldn't have the confidence to ask because it's um, a framework that's uh, elusive for me. Um, but it's a beautiful question and it's an anonymous uh, questioner who asks, if a book is the closest thing to a human being, I wonder if you might comment briefly on how you do or would conceive the religious dimension of a book's life. The religious dimension of a book's life? Yes, I, it's really interesting esoteric. Yeah, well, as book people, it's like um, librarians have to weed their collections, right? 
and it's yeah. uh, and sometimes you will see because I'm on like I'm on I I work on library and Twitter, and in library and Twitter there's also there's often a complaint where people will come across a, a trove of, of thrown out books, and they will be and they will be irate. They, you know they, why did they? And part of me is with both parties on this one because um, I know that a library can't hold everything forever. Um, but uh, but I also know it, it, it's it's tragic to see a, a book if it's the closest thing to a human being thrown out. Um, the, but the so I don't know. I do think of I, so I'll answer the question in a different way. But um, the bookshelves that we have, or the piles of books around our houses, different from the texts you have on your computer hard drive or that are on the cloud, I think of as clouds of ideas, you know, hard clouds of ideas or um, collections of people or friends. And, um, and we have them around us and we surround them in our, you know, we surround our lives, we, we um, embed them in our lives, we uh, hold them throughout our lives. And that I think is, uh, I think, we have a relationship with with these books, not so different often than we have with people, or with friendships anyway, or with loved ones, where we return to and we uh, we miss. And in between books, we, I often, you know, it, when you're reading, if you don't know what you're going to read next, you are in that searching and homeless phase. All those things are are relationships are are relational things that you have with people. So also so. I think there is a spiritual dimension to books in that sense. That's great. Yeah, you reminded me of something that I uh, always felt when um, <clears throat> uh, e-books were first being um, propagated, and uh, I'm sure you've experienced this, writers or just avid readers or, or people who love, obviously love books, book collectors, would be asked uh, whether they felt that there was something that would be lost if physical books, paper books, uh, binding books were replaced by eBooks. And I always felt that the question was too, uh, it overlooked the, the plural. And that is that, uh, yes, there's a kind of a value, a, a physical value that inheres in a single book object that I, you know, I do prefer to, to a, a Kindle or an e-reader, e but that, um, it was the room full of books that was the thing that was being not, that didn't live in that question the way I wanted it to. That the uh, spatiality of a library or a bookstore or a personal collection and the what you just called the hard cloud, entering into that space and physically being surrounded by them as potentialities. And this, you know, the, the moment I don't, I'm not sure I agree that it feels like a homelessness. There's also a kind of um, vibrancy when you're, if you if the books are present uh, you haven't chosen one yet then you might be reading any one of them at a, at a given time it's kind of like you're reading them all in that homelessness has a certain vibrancy to it. That's okay. yes okay could, yeah. could have um yeah i think it's a question of proportion too like if the infinite is the infinite and uh, your library is you know is something that is remote you know within some kind of human realm <laughs> and and i think that helps that helps as well. Um, the, the only thing I'll add is I remember, I forget who said it, maybe it was just a friend that said, you know, if you take all these statements about ebooks and you, you replace it with food in a tube, you basically get the same result. There's, there's some, anyways, that, that's, that's just maybe uh, poo pooing on the technology too easily, but I agree with you. <laughs> right. Um, I think that uh, I haven't necessarily asked you every question that was in the uh, QA, but quite a lot of them and you've been marvelous and um i think i think we'll let it wind down um it's so great to talk with you again it's great to talk with people i i, I you really know enjoy i we're it's a funny thing that can happen is we're um uh the body of our our little fledgling friendship is is all in full view like we've just talk we only talk in spaces where people are watching us talk but i i just so look forward to um uh, each occasion and um now I hope we can do it again to the next soon one yeah. and uh, maybe with, with 
in person and maybe uh, maybe with without strangers, <laughs> but but with strangers too. But anyways, it's great to talk with you. Dynamite. Um, thanks again to the, the uh, community bookstore for um, inviting me into this conversation with Eugene and and Eugene. Great congratulations on a beautiful book. Um, I, I hope you're really enjoying having it uh, go into people's hands now. Thank you. It's a it's it's a it's a pleasure talking. Great. Thank thanks you so both much. for such a wonderful evening, and take care, everyone. <laughs>